Hello, good evening and welcome to Catalan Cymru Erosion Session. This live session is focusing on politics AS and uh, hopefully has um, uh, come at the end of you using the online sessions, the pre-recorded sessions on the Catalan Cymru website. Now these four, uh, three sessions, apologies, have focused on specific elements of the AS specification and really honed in on the comparison element. And hopefully you'll have seen that from the, uh, the, the kind of run through of a section B pass paper question on each of the sessions. So session one was a comparison between the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the European Convention of Human Rights. Session two was a comparison of the House of Lords and the House of Commons, both sitting within government of the UK. And then session three is comparison between the Prime Minister on the, uh, on the UK level and the First Minister on the Welsh level, just the Welsh level and, and just the Welsh First Minister as well, not the Scottish First Minister. Now, if watching those sessions, you noticed like that I uh, gave Venn diagrams for each of the sessions and suggested that these became a tool then with which you could use them to demonstrate your knowledge, to show what you've picked up, because revision is not just about making revision notes. Revision isn't just about listening to videos or podcasts, etc. Revision is about using that information, using it in a way that you can then make connections. You can silo it to certain parts of the specification so you know that that's a reference to that. So if you've got a question asked on that element of a specification, you know what to draw out. And it's also about using the knowledge, using the knowledge that you've got rather than just refreshing yourself. So what we're going to do in this is we're going to spend about 15 minutes or maybe just about 10, 10 15 minutes on each of these Venn diagrams pulling out some of the comparison elements because you remember section b the section b question asks you to compare and contrast and when you compare and contrast you're looking for similarities and you're looking for differences so a venn diagram i'll come back to that and um, highlighting the specification now a venn diagram is perfect for similarities and differences now i'm just going to make sure my pen's working here it is good so what you've got is the big kind of circle should be your differences or your unique elements. Whilst the overlapping, because it's overlapping, it means it's similarities. I'll try my spelling of similarities. So, and these are, um, uh, well, things that they share, isn't it? So what we're going to do is we're going to work through one of these per session. So in the session itself, I gave you all the details you needed in order to do it and advise that you did it. And now we're going to work through them and we're going to see that you can use it if you've done it. You can use it as a chance to, to kind of uh, self-assess, make sure you've got the key bits of information you need. Or if you've not done it, then you can use it as a way to really enhance um, uh, your thinking by applying this to that. So the first one we did. Uh, which lined up with the first session is living and participating in democracy kind of uh, 2.1 or from unit two and section one from unit two we looked at the european convention of human rights and the universal declaration of human rights and what we did is we looked at an outline of each of these what these were and then we began to compare them in terms of uh, how they were enforced and things like that so what I'll do, I've printed out the information so it's in front of me and it can help me and give me prompts. What I'll do is I will go through these and I'll add details in as we go. Now bear in mind I'm going to add details in in shorthand. It's a little bit harder for me to write on this screen than it would be for you if you say printed it out. Well in fact what I could do is just pause for 30 seconds in a second and a, any piece of A4 paper or A3, however big or small you want it, just draw two massive every circles and that don't have to be perfect circles at all. Um, you can get your, you can create your own Venn diagram. So I'll tell you what, I'll, just, I'll stop talking with 30 seconds just to allow you time to do that. And then we'll, uh, we'll jump in. Okay, so what we've got then is we started with a description of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we found that it was made by the UN 
in 1948. So this is a difference. This is something that's specific to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because it's a different year to that that the European Convention has made. And it's the UN, it's the United Nations. It's a global thing, not just a European thing. And it was the first recognition of human rights. It's the first recognition of human rights. And so it's again, this is a this has got to be a difference, isn't it? Because if it's the first, then it can't be at the same time as the European Convention of Human Rights. And what it did was it outlined fundamental rights and freedoms um, in which people could enjoy. Now they are similarities because both of these outline fundamental rights and freedoms. That's the very basis of both of these documents, that they're outlining their fundamental rights and freedoms. So the Universal, sorry, the European Convention of Human Rights then was instead made law in 1951. Apologies, 1951. And is just on a European level. Not a global level. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights outlines 30 separate articles. 30 separate rights that we have. Whilst the Universal, sorry, whilst the European Convention of Human Rights instead has a grand total, I just want to remember again, grand total of 138. So there's a big difference in terms of size and comprehensiveness. And you remember when we were uh, discussing this in the session, one of the key things I pointed out to you was that the European Convention of Human Rights is what we call a living document, whilst the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is what we call a static document. Now, the reason for that is the European Convention of Human Rights has been uh, modified and changed no less than six times. You've got six modifications, whilst the Universal Declaration has changed zero times. It has remained the same ever since it was first published in 1948. So what else have we got? Well, we've got different examples of rights. Now, I'm not going to write these on the screen here because uh, these are ones that you can pick out and use as examples. In fact, having examples of both the European Convention and the Universal Declaration would be great for the Section A questions, the six mark questions. You never know, they might ask you that. What I would do, an easy, um, an easy way around this potentially, is to have the same for both. So you've got some that cross over. There's some that cross over. And so if you have, if you kind of remember, say, five of those that cross over in both, then you're sorted on both fronts, really, aren't you? Now, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has inspired 80 other international conventions, inspired 80 conventions. And one of those conventions that it is inspired is the European Convention on Human Rights. And therefore, this is something that is a, is, is a distinct difference, isn't it? The fact that it's inspired other conventions like the European Convention on Human Rights is different. What else? So we said that it has changed six times with the European Convention on Human Rights, whilst the Universal Declaration of Human Rights hasn't changed at all. Now, the next element we really dived into was the enforcement of each of these. And I tell you what, apologies, we're going to go back one step to similarities. There are some similarities in terms of the rights. So in the examples I gave you, we had the prohibition of torture, in the Treaty of Rome. What we've got in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the right from inhumane punishment. So we have got inhumane slash torture protection from. So a, a fair degree of the similarity between these are many of the rights that these two have. Both of them talk about freedom of expression or freedom to uh, you know, freedom of um, freedom of thought, freedom of religion. And so there are similarities as well. 
things that span over across the two. In terms of uh, uh, enforcement then, what we saw was we saw that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was what's called a moral code. Now, have a watch that session. What you'll what you'll see, I mean by that, is the fact it isn't specifically a law. You can't go to a court of law in Britain or indeed anywhere in the world and say this person has broken my right to own property. You can't do it. But what it instead it does is it becomes a moral code, a guider. And if you remember the quote, or the, I gave a quote from Ban Ki-moon, one of the ex-general secretary generals of the United Nations. He talked about it as being a yardstick, a way in which we measure how much our society is uh, uh, human friendly, is liberal in how it deals with its people rather than dictatorial or inhumane. And we said some of the other ways in which the uh, uh, the world is uh, these rights are enforced are through Amnesty International. But when we saw when we looked at it, actually, we saw that the Amnesty International was also something that draws attention to breaches of the European Convention of Human Rights as well. So Amnesty International, my writing is appalling, I apologise. Amnesty International is the organisation, a charity, that's job is to highlight breaches of human rights, to highlight around the world where these people's rights have not been respected. And I use the examples of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, um, and also, in fact, uh, they highlighted the British government's introduction of the Police Crime and Sentencing Courts Act in 2022, which they said prevented the freedom of peaceful association, something that's guaranteed under both the European Convention and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Whilst the European Convention of Human Rights is enforced instead through law, it is a regional law. And by that means, what we've got is we do have the ability to take an organisation to, uh, to court to say that they have broken our human rights under the European Convention. So, a key difference here is that the courts enforce it. Now, since 1997 in Britain, that's the British courts as a whole. But even before that, it was the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, which enforced it as well. So you can take your uh, cases through the courts and there's a final arbiter, which is and I write final arbiter. which is the European Court of Human Rights, which is in Strasbourg. And there is no final arbiter, there is no court for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, giving you a distinct and key difference between the two of them. So what else are some similarities and some differences? Well, similarities could be that these are guides of respect. They are both guides of respect to individuals and uh, individuals' freedoms and individuals' rights. Now, I also went through with you some of the some of the differences. What the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was not, uh, what the European Convention and the Universal Declaration were not. Well, they're not tied up to being part of the European Union. Apologies, I'm going to sneeze. They're not tied up to being members of the European Union. And that's for both of these, right? So they're not associated with the EU, as many think. We also saw that the current British government is talking about removing Britain from the European Convention of Human Rights. So that is a distinct difference because, and I'll explain it now in a second, removal from ECHR by government. Now that's a key difference because the Human Rights Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the British government isn't talking about removing us from that. 
And that's probably because it's a moral code rather than something that's law. And the reason I would suggest for that is that the government itself, as highlighted by Amnesty International, the government itself could be held account for some of the things it's doing in breaches of the European Convention of Human Rights, whilst it can't be held account so well for that from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so it means probably that they're more likely to say, well, we could leave the uh, European Convention and we won't have to put up with examples of the uh, Rwanda asylum bill making its way to the European Court of Human Rights and the British government being told no. There's nothing under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights being signatories of it that says that it can say no to a government. It's just that moral yardstick instead. So that is the uh, Venn diagram for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the European Convention of Human Rights. Now, you might well have more similarities, more differences from what you've done from a revision session you listened to or from what you've done in class, and that's great. And remember, when it comes to section B, that gives you an extract, doesn't it? And then it asks you to compare and contrast. And the structure I suggested was a four paragraph structure of similarities, differences. So I'll just put S and D for shorthand, right? So, Similarities initially using the extract, differences initially using the extract, similarities then using your own knowledge, and differences then using your own knowledge. Well, similarities and differences from the uh, extract, you would back up with this, but similarities for your knowledge, you'd lift straight out of this. Differences, you'd lift straight out of these here. Perfect to lift straight out. So the second one we looked at was the structure, role and powers of Parliament. And we said quite clearly that this was split into two elements, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. So we're going to do exactly the same thing again now. We're going to do another Venn diagram again, but I'll just put shorthand here. I'll put D for differences, S for similarities. Differences between the Houses of House of Commons and the House of Lords. Now, what we said initially was what, what's important to know is that these both fit into the overall Houses of Parliament, but they have their own distinctive roles, their own distinctive structure and their own distinctive powers as well. And the first thing we said was that the House of Commons is elected. And we looked at a constituency map of the UK to show that uh, the majority of MPs at the moment are Conservative because of more blue than there was any other colour. Um, that there are different parties. You've got Plaid Cymru, SNP, Labour, Conservative, DUP in Northern Ireland, etc. And in the House of Commons, you've got 650 MPs who are elected every five years. And these all represent an area of land, a constituency. They all represent a constituency. And currently there are 350 Conservatives, 198 Labour, 43 SNP, 15 Liberal Democrats, 8 Union, the Democratic Unionists, 3 Plaid Cymru along with Independents, etc, etc. This vaguely reflects, although there's one key difference, vaguely reflects the kind of majorities, the makeups within the House of Lords. So the same party in both is the biggest. It's the biggest. And that's important. Now, the Conservative Party isn't the majority in the House of Lords, but nonetheless, it's still the biggest party in the House of Lords which makes a difference in terms of getting laws through the House of Lords as well. So the House of Commons, you're talking green benches, as you can see from the logo, House of Lords, red benches, as you can see from their colour logo. You have the Speaker in the House of Commons, but you also have the Lord Speaker in the House of Lords as well. So in both, you have a Speaker who controls the debate. Right? Who's the mediator in the middle, a bit like the ref on the football pitch, right? He is the or she is the person that controls who speaks when, how long they speak for, etc. Now, in both the House of Lords and the House of Commons, you also have your front bench and your back bench. 
MPs or Lords. Front bench being those who are ministers, back bench being those who aren't ministers. And in both, they literally sit facing each other in what we call an adversarial way. They face off against each other and it makes it a lot more adversarial, it makes it a lot more uh, highly strung, a lot more like a debate. Now, in terms of the Lords, we saw that these were appointed. And appointed by the monarch. And we saw that they have both Lord Temporal and Lord Spiritual as well. So in here. We have bishops, right? They are also members of the House of Lords. Some 92 are elected, so I'm going to put a little tiny elected down the bottom here. Maybe I'm going to put election rather than elected. Let's explain why now. Election. Now, every single one of the 650 MPs are elected. In the House of Lords, there's 92 hereditary peers. Now, what that means is they've inherited being a lord from their father or their grandfather, well, from their father. And so they then no longer have the entitlement to sit in the House of Lords. What they have to do is they have to be elected among themselves. So of the, and I don't know how many hereditary peers there are in the country, but of however many hundred of them there are, they have to be elected in order to sit in the House of Lords. So it's not factually correct to say that everyone in the House of Lords is appointed, but equally it's not correct to say that the House of Lords is elected at all because it's a very small number and the number of people that vote for the hereditary peers are just other hereditary peers. They aren't the user me's of this world, who, well unless any of you are lords and ladies at home, right, then it's just those lords, not the user me's, the normal people in the world. Now, in total, there are 785 members of the House of Lords. And what's interesting is it is the only upper house, it is the only second chamber in the world which is bigger than the primary chamber by the lower house. They still have the same political parties, so. Like political parties in our similarities, you still have members from Conservative, Labour, uh, Liberal Democrat. What is interesting though is you have none from the SNP. The SNP refuse on principle to have Lords in the House of Lords. They only have MPs. Something the Lords have, which the Commons doesn't, is crossbenchers. And you'll have seen in the photo that I showed you the House of Lords, they've literally, they've got their two rows facing each other on either side. And in the middle, they've literally got benches in the middle, which in the House of Commons is empty space and the House of Lords is filled with other benches. And they are literally in between the benches on the government side and on the opposition side. And therefore they are across the benches or cross benches. And they're members of no political party at all. So what about the roles? Well, they all or they both pass laws. They both scrutinise the executive. Or the government, for other words, and they both, I'm going to have to find a bit more space here, aren't I? They both provide ministers. There are some key differences in these, though, and that is that in terms of providing ministers, the House of Commons usually provide cabinet. Sorry, apologies. Cabinet. And since 1902. Always. The PM. Always the Prime Minister. Now we've seen quite recently that actually what people thought for a long time was the norm, which was that cabinet members were from the House of Commons. We've seen that kind of thrown into disarray with David Cameron, the ex prime minister being made foreign secretary and in order to be foreign secretary he had to be an MP or a Lord. Well, he stood down as an MP, so he's made a Lord straight away. And as a result, then we've now got a member of the cabinet 
who's from the House of Lords. And this isn't just plugging a gap. We had Nikki Morgan uh, a few years ago. She was just plugging a gap in between elections. David Cameron is seen as a long term appointment as Foreign Secretary from the House of Lords. So when it comes to passing laws, uh, this is something that they both do and you learn about this in terms of the, uh, the parliamentary ping pong as it moves back and forth. There is one important element here, which is that the House of Commons only deals with tax laws. Anything to do with money or money bills, as they're called, they only go for the House of Commons. The House of Lords don't involve themselves in it. Principally because up until 1997, the House of Lords were hereditary peers who had uh, for a long time been um, much richer and therefore they, uh, well, they weren't going to agree to tax increases to the richest because it would have disproportionately affected them. Now, another one that is a difference is the House of Commons represents the electorate. Now, because the members of parliament are elected, they represent the people that elected them. They represent them in the constituencies they're from, whether that's Montgomeryshire, whether that's Ceredigion, whether that's Aravon in the north, whether that's Cardiff West, they are the constituencies and they represent those people. So for example, I'm, I'm taking students to visit parliament in a couple of weeks time, and we will go to meet only Craig Williams, who is the member of parliament for Montgomeryshire, because he represents us. The MP for Ceredigion, and Ben Lake, or the MP for Avon doesn't represent people from Montgomeryshire. And in the Lords, because they're appointed, there's no element of representation. There's no element of representation at all. And it's that first past the post system that really ties MPs to their areas because they're specifically elected from that constituency. One thing the House of Lords does, which the Commons doesn't do, is host the monarch. So you'll notice the state opening of Parliament always happens in the House of Lords. The King or the Queen before him always made their speech from the House of Lords. That dates back all the way to King Charles I, when King Charles I uh, uh, burst into the House of Commons to arrest five MPs, and it was seen as a uh, um, uh, gross infiltration, a gross attack on the commoners and the ordinary people of the country. And so ever since, it is only the House of Lords that hosts the monarch as well. And Black Rod, you might have seen the video, Black Rod is sent to hammer on the door of the House of Commons to uh, see where the MPs are to bring them to the monarch themselves. The House of Lords can only delay legislation, whilst the House of Commons can vote it down. Both can propose laws. So the House of Lords can only delay it, delay that law for two years. It can't ever vote a law down, it just delays it. In the hope, I suppose, that for uh, two years down the line, the issue will have uh, dropped off the radar of uh, the House of Commons and the government at the time, um, and any controversial element might then have been watered down, etc. There's one other thing that means that uh, there's one other explicit, which is what's called the Salisbury Convention. And the Salisbury Convention is essentially the idea that if a political party puts in their manifesto that they are going to do this, they're going to do X and they win the election and they then go on to do X, the House of Lords can't vote it down or can't delay it. Because what it's saying, or what the Salisbury Convention says, is that the people of the country have voted for that measure because it was in the manifesto that the party set out in order to be elected. So as a result, the unelected Lords can't then vote it down. So there's your second uh, Venn diagram. Again, as I said, similarities and differences in your section B can easily be deployed from here. Your difference paragraphs literally takes information out of the differences, your similarities literally takes out that similarities there. So, as I suggested before, go away, have a go at the question, bring it to your teacher, whoever it is, and I'm sure they'll uh, be, they'll be very happy that you've done this all by yourself, uh, without the help of any revision video or anything like that, 
and um, they'll be very impressed. Just don't tell them about, well, no, please do tell them about this so that uh, they can suggest it to their other students, but still. So lastly then is looking at the difference between the Prime Minister and the First Minister. So within Unit 1, uh, you've got Unit 1.2, uh, uh, Section 1.2, sorry, which is Government of the UK, and Section 1.3, which is about devolution in the UK. But both look at the roles, powers and resources of the leader of those governments. So the leader of the UK government and the leader of the Welsh government. So last, by no means least, we'll do a quick Venn diagram of these as well. So the first and most obvious thing to state is that the Prime Minister is UK as a whole. The First Minister is Wales only. So Rishi Sunak is the Prime Minister of the UK as a whole. Mark Drakeford is the First Minister, or at least for, uh, for the next month or so, the First Minister of just Wales. Now, we looked at the roles of the, power, roles of the First Minister and roles of the Prime Minister, and we saw that both are chief policy makers. Now, they're both chief policy makers within their areas, within, as we've already caveated with, Rishi Sunak in the UK and Mark Drakeford within Wales, but they're still chief policy makers. They're the ones that suggest the policies of the government and are the people who leads on the delivery of those policies as well. They are both the head of government. Rishi Sunak is the head of the UK government, Mark Drakeford is the head of the Welsh government, but they are still head of a government. They're both their chief spokesperson. If you were to see an interview on the TV between uh, a journalist and Mark Drakeford and he stated that this was the policy, and then you saw an interview with the education minister, Jeremy Miles, and he said this policy, which was different, well, it would be assumed that what Mark Drakeford had said was the correct one because he is the chief spokesperson of the government. He is the person who is coordinating the government. And that's actually no better, really, than in COVID, actually, where you saw the number of press conferences held by Mark Drakeford in Wales and Boris Johnson in the UK. You can see that's a clear indication of their chief spokesperson role. One thing that Rishi Sunak has, which Mark Drakeford doesn't have, is the de facto, so kind of, in fact, commander in chief. The person in charge of the armed forces. Defence is a reserved matter, something only the UK government deals with, and therefore Mark Drakeford has no say over the use of the army, and so is in no way the de facto commander in chief. The, the de jure, the legal commander in chief is the king, but he delegates that power almost, uh, almost across the board to the Prime Minister. They are also both the Parliament leaders as well, parliamentary leaders. They are the leaders of the biggest parties in both parliaments. The Conservatives are the biggest party in the UK Parliament in Westminster and the Labour Party or the Welsh Labour Party is the biggest party in the Senate in the Welsh Parliament as well. Now within this there's also some other key similarities. We've got the idea that they are both, they can both to some extent, give patronage. Now by this I mean cabinet positions, um, dismiss ministers, appoint ministers, reshuffle cabinet. The only difference is Rishi Sunak can also appoint or suggest rather than appoint lords and also knighthoods and things like that. You'll see lots of MPs are Sir so-and-so or Dame so-and-so. That is, that means that they are ladies, uh, that, sorry, that they've been given a knighthood or uh, equivalent in ladies being Damehood um, by the Prime Minister as a reward for their work in Parliament. Both have authority within the cabinet system. Both have complete authority within it. So, as a result, they set the agenda, they chair the meetings. The only difference is, is that Rishi Sunak has 23 cabinet members, whilst Mark Drakeford has 11 cabinet members. 
So they've got a Mark Drakeford's got a smaller cabinet to which he can appoint people. Party leadership, well, both are the leaders of their parties, as we put parliamentary leaders. However, the Welsh system means it is less likely to have a majority uh, a majority of members of Senev. The electoral system within the Senev is much less likely to give a majority. So it means to some extent their party leadership is limited because the first minister is going to have less proportionally less members of Senev to back them. Now that's not always correct. Theresa May under the uh, um, uh, before the pre, uh, pre the last election, before the last election, actually was a minority government, whilst Mark Drakeford is, uh, has got bang on half the members of Senev. But nonetheless, you can see that um, as a result, uh, sorry, nonetheless, more frequently it is the other way around. Rishi Sunak at the moment has a much bigger majority, whilst Mark Drakeford is just there. It's not a minority government, but it's also not a majority government because there are exactly half the members of Senev from the Labour Party. Both have public standing, but the Prime Minister has greater public standing. If there is a national disaster, if there is a national event, uh, I'm speaking today, yesterday, uh, the news came out that the King's been diagnosed with having cancer, where the person that the news uh, agencies went to for a statement first and foremost wasn't Mark Drakeford, it was Rishi Sunak, the British Prime Minister. So in a moment like that, they then have greater public standing as a result. Both have key policy making roles, both make, uh, make policies within their government, but what happens or what's uh, different with the Welsh government is that they are constrained by what is devolved and what is reserved. The Welsh government has its power on what has been devolved to it by the UK government. And that is far less, far fewer things than what the UK government has control over. So for example, Mark Drakeford can't make policy on the civil service in Wales, can't make policy on cross-border rail, within Wales, can't make policy on the police and justice system within Wales because they are all reserved by the UK government and Rishi Sunak. Resources then, well, £770 billion pounds a year as opposed to £23 billion pounds a year. I'm just double checking my figure before I tell you wrong. I don't have 20 billion, 20 billion a year. So if we're thinking about scale and size of budget, well, Rishi Sunak, the UK government has a much bigger budget and therefore much more power as well. Um, civil servants. The UK Prime Minister has control over civil servants and actually has the his own individual prime minister's office with civil service. The Welsh government doesn't have it has civil servants that work for it, but it doesn't have the policy and control over those civil servants. So there is a short and sweet summary or Venn diagram of these uh, three things that we looked at, three sessions, which show you the differences and the similarities between each of them. So remember, a section B has, in terms of structure, I would advise four paragraphs, focus on similarities, differences, similarities, differences. First two paragraphs would use the extract that's presented to you. And second two would, your, would use your own knowledge. And you can lift these straight from here. If you've done these Venn diagrams, you can lift them. Similarities coming from your middle bit. Differences coming from your unique circles as well.
Now I've done these, I've done these fairly quickly, right? Um, my handwriting isn't the best on this screen. It's like I promise it's a lot better in person, um, although some of my students might disagree with that when they see my essay feedback. But nonetheless, it's better in person. You can use this as a tool again and again, and you can use the same idea for other sections of the specification as well. So, are there any questions? If there are any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the question and answer function. Um, I'll have a look at it now and see if there are any questions whatsoever. There are no questions. No questions, lovely. Well, in that case, hopefully you found this useful, you found this interesting, and hopefully this gives you a better, better sense then as to how you can um, use uh, this specific tool or how a specific tool, sorry, can help and be used to set you up well for your exam, for specific sections of the exam. Obviously, section A and section C is different how you approach it, but section B, there is no better preparation tool than these, these Venn diagrams. So thank you very much for using this resource. Um, as I've shared with you some tips to succeed at politics AS, and ultimately, I wish you all the very best in those exams. Think Venn diagrams when you see section B. Thank you very much.